Uh, I'm going to try and save an awful lot of time and go pretty fast and I know that I'm Scottish and I've not turned on my microphone, have I? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah fine, good, right. If you can't hear me, come closer. It's good, it's not a problem. Okay, so um, what we're going to talk about is um, advanced persistent attacks. And one of the reasons that we're going to talk about it is it's a phrase that we keep on hearing over and over and over again. And it's a phrase that people cannot define very well. Uh, literally, I was in the, a top 10 bank, perhaps. I don't know, something's playing, it's a bit weird. I was in a top 10 bank the other day. And I actually had to explain to them what EPT stood for which is a little bit worrying if you stop and think. Thank you very much. Perfect. Um, Barry, you'll appreciate that from Blackberry. I couldn't resist it. Van Gogh. It's an anagram of Govan. Right, so um, a little bit about Van Gogh for you. It's got about 50 billion people in it. It's got large steel manufacturing works. It's got ambitions to be a very large superpower, uh, but it's got huge agricultural second world kind of problems and things like that. And that's the Democratic Republic of Van Gogh. And that's the country that we're going to be talking about today. Um, right, a little bit of background to APTs. People don't ever seem to get the percentages right either. This comes from the cops, right? So I'm not, not just making it up or pulling it out of the air. They consider 98% to be easy or moderate. And they mean easy or moderate in a different sense than you and I mean easy or moderate. They don't mean easy by knock the door and get the guy. Right? which works sometimes, actually, believe it or not. <laughs> they mean they don't have to put in a huge amount of effort to get the particular criminal or to get the crime, right? What they are really concerned about is the 2% they classify as moderate to hard. And they group them as APTs. And the three main groupings that they get them are organized crime, intelligence services and state-sponsored espionage, industrial espionage that's done on a state-sponsored level. And that is about 2%. What they're interested in um, is corporate and industrial espionage, all the normal stuff that you would expect. They're interested in intellectual property. They are more and more interested in trade secrets. Small things that you can extract quickly from a network, rather than to have to download the plan for an entire battleship, it isn't it much better to get the press release saying the battleship isn't going to go to sea for another month because of some sort of delay and embarrass the country that way. That's only one file to extract, rather than all the plans for a battleship. So, more interested in that, they're more into financial uh, markets and market reporting because they are beginning to hook into these high-frequency trading bots, these horrible things, so that if they can get the PDF of, you know, those announcements that are, we're, what is that noise? There is something on Yuri's laptop that's making a noise. I'm sorry if it's a problem. I just have to deal with it. Um, oh. You might be telling me to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> can never tell with these guys. Um, so, yeah, look, they're more interested in this kind of stuff. They are going more and more after critical national infrastructure. I know you all know this. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but pulling it all together and actually seeing it in front of you. When you think about it, if you leap from corporate and industrial espionage, intellectual property theft is the next thing, trade secrets, financial market destabilization of a country, critical national infrastructure. Do you know there's only three days worth of bread in the UK? Three days. If you could stop all the bread getting to the supermarkets for three days, you would have riots in the streets. <laughs> it's true. It's deadly true. And let's just hope that we're all such nice people that we would never do anything like that. 
energy and telemetry data, they're getting more into that, right? Disruptive technology. Anything government, military, and GA, there's always been a big fan of. Biotechnology and the drugs trade. Now, do we know about big pharma, the drugs trade, and how much it's worth? Yes, no? Right, I'll give you the small version of it, right? When they make a drug, if one person during the drug trial dies, the drug is scrapped. So we literally could be sitting and they, and they made thousands of drugs. And that's why the cost of bringing one drug to market is in the billions. Because if one person dies and they do one thing wrong in the trials, then it's out the window. We could be sitting on top of the cure for cancer. And because somebody died in a trial, we're never going to find out. So there you go. That's a rather sobering thought. Have fun. Um, <laughs> why financial gain, GDT, GDP impact, competitive advantage, CNI disruption? This is a biggie. Fixing of the futures of the energy market. Notice the oil price came back up yesterday. 252, but. $52 a barrel from down from a low of 24 and a high of 124. Mmm. And somebody had a meeting with the Democratic Republic of Ango and asked them nicely to slow their oil down a little bit if they could, please. Yeah, all this is going on. Sectors, pretty much everything. But particularly, <laughs> particularly, yeah, you're all fucked. Uh, <laughs> This isn't being live streamed, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I want editing rights on this, man. Um, no, in all seriousness, what we are noticing as a company, particularly leading disruptive technology, right? Big telcos, big companies that are working on new things, like Tesla. Good example. Unfortunately, we were one of the companies involved in the Tesla recall. So the more people keep on putting Android into cars, I think we can all agree that is a very bad thing, and we should be putting more solid operating systems like QNX would be a good choice, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it runs the Eurofighter, runs an MRI. I'd drive a car with QNX in it over a car with Android in it any day of the week. You want to speak to that man there? Um, anything leading is disruptive, so they're going after the startups just as much as they are the big BPs and the SOs and things like that. They're kind of diversifying. At the same time, the level of APT and the level of script kiddy are becoming to meet each other. And if you want an example of that, if you're a techie, Mimi Cats, prime example. A skiddy could not do what you can do with Mimi Cats three years ago, could they? Couldn't do it. Now it's three commands. What are you saying? You saying you could? <laughs> oh, we'll have a competition later on. Um, right, so I did say I'd try and go faster. This <laughs> is the worst slide ever. <laughs> this is an American fighter. Don't know which one, right? The F-14 or something. In 1998, designed by Lockheed Martin, the DOD and NASA. This is the People's Republic of Van Gogh's version of the same plane. I am not a fighter pilot. They are the same plane. The unfortunate problem is, the People's Republic of Van Gogh couldn't get the plane off the ground because they didn't have the tooling ability that Lockheed Martin had, which made them step up the game. And the game carries on. Say that again. It was, it was eventually, you're dead right. You're dead right. You're dead right. But initially, the first three runs, they couldn't get, get it off the ground because of the weight of the steel. They couldn't manufacture the steel to the tolerance. <laughs> Which is ironic, isn't it? Uh, the, the Van Gogh seems to have a lot of steel now. Um, so we've got RSA, we've got Google, we've got the Iranian centrifuges. And then, really, the whole point of the slide is to show you that, you know, it started off from silly, funny things like stealing people's jet designs. And now we're up to serious stuff that is across every single sector. Here's roughly the figures. 
Piracy, 1 to 16 billion. Drug trafficking, 600 billion. That's interestingly 5% of world GDP. And global cyber activity. I've made a small mistake here because actually I should have moved the decimal point up. But as you can see, they're pretty close to each other. Global cyber activity is, it's up there with drug trafficking. It's about half of it. So and That does not include digital piracy. So, what's the ecosystem look like? Well, here's roughly how they do it. They have a bag man. That's his job. His job is just to spot you, to sit on LinkedIn, try and find you, to sit and look at job adverts and see if you got that job, to try and figure out what technology stack you use, to try and figure out who your gran is, to try and figure out what church your mum goes to. Anything to create a dossier which will allow Team A to send a potentially successful phishing email. The bag men don't really do the initial compromise. Once Team A get in with 99.9% .9 of the time a spear phishing email, first thing they go for is persistence, second thing they go for is recon, third thing they go for is data exfiltration, and they will be using known tools. So they will be using things out of Cali that you'd recognize you would hope your IDS would pick them up. <laughs> You'd hope. First thing to do, go for Active Directory. Of course. Pivot through Active Directory, put it out to your command control center. Next thing they go for is the critical assets, financial market data. They exfiltrate that. Then back doors for persistence. Leave the command and control computer going. Close everything down, just go nice and slow and nice and quiet and wait until the company makes an announcement or you want to destabilize them or do what you want to do to them. So, that's roughly the principle. We can do this one dead quickly, because it's like teaching granny to suck eggs. If I'm company A, I need supplier B to make my new thing, my new fancy thing. And then supplier C's got to do the build technique. If at any point it gets stolen, the IP gets stolen from these two places that are weak because they're part of the integrated supply chain, then company B gets to the final product first. And this happens all the time. And don't think that it doesn't, that it's not going on every single day. With everything from pharmaceuticals to soft drinks. Okay. How are we doing for t how much time do I have, guys? Really? Can we do 20 minutes? Can you guys see it 20 minutes? Okay, cool. Sweet, let's start boring these people. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so here's your traditional way of doing it, that you, you know, you walk into the dodgy company and you see, or you're like, oh, we've got security because we've got antivirus. Oh, what does your antivirus do? Oh, it hashes known values of viruses. Trivial. Let's all say it together. One, two, three. Trivial. <laughs> I can put in a fucking full stop and then recompile it and you're done. Right, IP addresses. Let's all say it together. Easy, Easy whitelisting. Domain names. One, two, three. Simple. Yeah, think about it. Don't let your staff go to dodgyladies.com. <laughs> Actually, in this city, Maybe that's allowed. Um, <laughs> network and host artifacts, stuff that's actually been physically put into the system. That's where it starts to get annoying because you can take them out, but you, you can never be 100% sure of them. The tools are challenging, and I don't know why it says TTP, it should say ATPs. The ATPs are the tough ones because they're coming in with their own tools. Let me just go back up slide. I forgot to say something. Uh, oh no, I haven't. It's just further on. Okay, so you can see next to it, like, your end users are your first line of defense. Your authentication, how good your authentication is, how good your network is, is what's defending you there. Your network, your firewalls, your artifacts are defending you there. These, this is the bit where people are getting into trouble 
because everybody's wanting threat intelligence, and everybody's wanting to have a sock, but nobody actually knows. Have you ever read, is anybody a, a, a Hare Krishna? Is anybody a Hare Krishna? Because I, I don't want to offend them. No, no, so, so I can tell this. Right, or a UFO guy. <laughs> right? Do you know those books on UFOs, right, about the pyramids? And you read, you read that they've got 11 chapters. And you read the first 10 and you go, hi, the rocks are really big. How did they move all the rocks in that amount of time? This makes total sense. And then you turn to chapter 11 and it says aliens did it. <laughs> this is the problem we have with threat intelligence. I defy you. Go get a threat intelligence book. It will tell you where to look for. It will tell you how to do bits of it. Get to the chapter that says, and now what do I do with all this shit? Totally back. Nobody's figured that one out yet. So, you need a good early warning system, you need attacker alerting, you need decent SOC services, and these people need to be talking to each other on a constant basis. Physically talking, not just, well done, you can install Splunk, kind of talking, right? Okay, um, here is actually an example of one of the exploits that we had that I wanted to talk to you about. As you can see, all the IPs are in Vango. Right, the command and control centers in Vango. That's its DNS. Exfiltration. No, it's not. Right, they don't exist. Try, bash your head against them all day, nothing will happen. Um, and that's pretty much how we managed to do it. Um, let me do, show you the remediation because it's quite a nice graph and then it kind of puts it into context. Um, this took six months and cost about seven million pounds. So, do you know when you read in the newspapers, it's a 10 million pound remediation, a 10 million pound hack, and it's gonna take nine months to fix. Here's why. Don't tell anybody else. Go back a second. Right, the attacker's in, and they got availability. Security control efficacy. Doesn't exist. And our understanding of the attacker is that tiny little turquoise line there. We leave them in the system. That's the bit people don't get. They're like, what? You leave them in the system? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, how'd you catch a bad guy? How'd you know where they live unless you can snoop about and check and see where they're doing? We leave them in the system. As we leave them in the system, we discover more about their methodologies. Sometimes they clock on at nine o'clock in the morning and five o'clock at night in Van, in Van Gogh. And, 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 they, and they take Van Gogh national holidays, <laughs> of which there are quite a few. It's a great country. Once we've got to this point, we know what sort of controls we need. We know what we need to start thinking about doing, but we can't do it quite yet. Because they're in, and they've got the back door. As the understanding improves, based on all the investigation and the analysis, give me a second till I can find the up button. The attacker stays active due to our lack of understanding of what he's doing, or us not telling it, or how he's doing it. Notice how the lines cross at this point. As we figured out what he's done, the controls are improved. The more we can understand about the hacker, the longer we can leave them in the system, the better and more efficacious we can make the controls that we put in place. Improvements to the controls reduce the attacker's mobility, so we start to box them in. But not so much that they think they've been caught. Because then, this is my favorite bit, Attacker stays active, of course they do. And bang, that's the point of remediation. That is a weekend. No joking. Whole company will be done in a weekend. This is six months planning, leaving them active, gathering information about them, figuring out where they're coming from, figuring out what tools they're using, figuring out what, how we need to rewrite our rule sets. All that kind of stuff. 
and then we will literally, we will kick them out over the weekend. Or one of Van Gogh's many holidays. <laughs> and boy, do they have a surprise when they come back to work on Monday. Uh, the remediation takes place quickly uh, to, to, to prevent a change in tactics. Um, based on the financial impact, either the network or the server access is limited, changes to the architecture are applied. This is all rock, you know, this is not rocket science to you guys. Um, points of network visibility must be in place, audit and logging's in place, systems patch, rebuilt, remediate, remediated, remediated. New AV signatures, pff, you may as well have them for all the good that they do you. Um, all controls are turned up and monitored aggressively. I would add staff training into this. If it, someone's been spearfished, then it's probably time to spend a bit, a bit of money on staff training. And there we go. Steady state of operations. We are up the top here. All working fine. They have been kicked out. But they are an advanced and persistent threat. So future activity is observable and we can quickly respond to them. Because the slide I was trying to find for you, and I'm almost done, so if you give me a second. I'm trying to find the bag man slide. There you go, right. If team A is kicked out at that point of remediation that we saw, team B will swing into action. That's where the persistent bit comes in. Team B are the guys that are older. They are the guys that, you know, when you hear guys that write a malware and assembly, and you're like, oh my God, who writes malware and assembly? Can you say? Uh, you do, sir. Yes, well done. Uh, <laughs> nobody else in this room can. Uh, so, yeah, that's what Team Media does. And, of course, just to finish up the presentation, take you right through the end of it. But, of course, the big question is, if there's an A team and if there's a B team, what's the obvious question? Oh, come on, think about it, folks. There's an A team, there's a B team, so is there a? It's a C team, yeah. And in the People's Democratic Republic of Van Gogh, they're married to each other. And they're considered military assets. I'm not joking. They have a Twitter account. I can't show it to you. So that's basic remediation and basic ideas. We try and make it a bit of fun. I've not gone through the boring governance stuff and stuff and like that with you. Um, are there any questions? I've tried to make it as enjoyable as I can for the end of the day. Yes, sir? Right, so, um, make it easy, please. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> It would depend who they are, right? If they turn out to be, let's say, the Russian Mafia, there ain't no point in writing a letter to the Russian police. <laughs> Do we, uh, uh, we, we work for the client, right? We have found nation state terrorists, script kiddies, anonymous, three-letter agencies in places, right? And if that happens, we pick up the phone, we have a phone number. And we say, should you really be there? Is there, a, is there some kind of you know, thing going on that we don't know about? Otherwise, you've got 48 hours, we're about to boot you out of the system. They can get their sims back in. It's not our problem. Uh, Sounds harsh, doesn't it? But it's reality. <laughs> if you, yeah, yeah, first one was great. Yeah, go for the second. <laughs> The C team, I can't show you the C team. Uh, they're so bastards uh, in Van Gogh. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, because the A team will be using script kiddie tools uh, to a high level, like there'll be meta exploiting stuff and things like that, but they won't just be hitting Armitage, you know. They will know how to do it. You will notice the B team by their network traffic, and then eventually you'll find their binaries and you'll notice that their binaries have been handwritten, right? And then the answer to your question is the C team is one level of craftiness. Above that, it's even harder to find. It's even more obfuscated. It's even lower, it's even slower. All right, so this is future hacker is either A, B, or C. Yeah. Any more questions? 
If it's a, is it about assembly, I can only do XOR. <laughs> I can do you NAND as well, but you know. <laughs> Yes, for um, sure. How do you deal with that? Because well, that's why I said education, to be honest, right? Because my. Yeah, but, but, um, I do believe, as the Tony Cole said, well, is that the company uh, has uh, education of yep. their own uh, workers as the last. Yep. Part. And it's crap. Yeah, it's crap. They do it. They, they they do it for pure tokenism. How do we do it, right? How do we make it more robust? Well, I worked in education for ten years. So the cheeky answer is you employ me to write your security software, your security sharing program for your company and deliver it in a bespoke manner. The other thing that we do is we do constant checking of people, right? People turn up to, how many times have you been to a new job, done the health and safety thing and then never done it again, right? So screen should be locked down once or twice. Questions should be asked. They should be warned once or twice. They're gonna get internally fished. Then, on the fourth time, they shouldn't be warned. Right? If we still have 400 people hitting that link, we've failed. And we need to look at it from a different angle. So that, that's the way I would look at it. Get a baseline, bring the baseline down. You can literally put it into cold hard figures and see, watching CEOs in boardrooms when you actually give them the money. That's 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 the way that that's the way you get them. For sure. Anything else? No, no, no comments, no. Anybody from Van Gogh want to sue me just now? <laughs> that's exactly what I'm gonna do, buddy. <laughs> exactly what I'm gonna do. It's all between whether you are faster or I am faster. I think you're faster. <laughs> Thanks very much guys, it's been really lovely talking to you.